Hey, if you missed class today, I read through section two of module 13 with the class and we filled out the worksheet in the module 13 file together. So I have a split screen set up right now to do just that. You're going to want to copy the notes as we go and especially what is highlighted because the highlighted material will be on the test at the end of the module. And if you have any questions at the end, you can message me. As always, you can just press pause anytime you need more time to copy something. So the title of this section um, is Changes in Working Life. And it says here, Mills Change Workers' Lives. We're going to find out about a couple of different systems that were used. There was the Rhode Island system, which we'll start with. It was started by Samuel Slater. We heard about him in section one. And then we'll move on to the Lowell system started by Francis Cabot Lowell. It says workers no longer needed the specific skills of craftspeople to run the machines of the new mills. We talked about that before. The lives of workers changed along with their jobs. Resistance to these changes sometimes sparked protests. Many mill owners in the United States could not find enough people to work in factories because other jobs were available. At first, Samuel Slater and his two partners used apprentices, young men who worked for several years to learn the trade. However, they often were given only simple work. For example, their jobs might include feeding cotton into the machines and cleaning the mill equipment. They grew tired of this work and frequently left. Apprentice James Horton, for example, ran away from Slater's mill. Quote, Mr. Slater kept me always at one thing, Horton complained. I might have stayed there until this time and never knew nothing. So in other words, the men are getting very bored um, doing these factory jobs um, and they're quitting. Eventually, Slater began to hire entire families who moved to Pawtucket to work in the mills. This practice allowed Slater to fill his labor needs at a low cost. Children, as well as adults, worked in the mills. So you'll notice that I have that highlighted blue. I've highlighted the Rhode Island system blue, and then when we switch to the Lowell system, I will switch the color. So right now, what we can do is go to our chart and we can fill in a couple of these details. So the Rhode Island system hired entire families. You're being instructed on your worksheet to list the ways that working life was different from how we do it today. And that is definitely a difference. When I applied to work at Blackhawk, they certainly didn't interview my entire family, right? Um, companies do not hire entire families anymore. So that's different. And also, Slater's system used child labor, which we do not do anymore, and in fact is illegal in the United States of America. That's highlighted. You'll need to know that the Rhode Island system used child labor for the test at the end of the module. All right, I'm going to keep going. You can press pause if you need to. On most farms, children worked to help their families. Therefore, few people complained about the hiring of children to work in factories. H. Humphrey, an author of books on raising children, told parents that children needed to be useful. Humphrey wrote, if he, a child, will not study, put him on to a farm or send him into the shop or in some other way provide regular employment for him. The machines made many tasks in the mill simple enough for children to do. Mill owners profited because they paid children low wages. Adults usually earned as much in a day as most children did in a week. So here's an example of an advertisement that was used in a newspaper in 1823 uh, for the Rhode Island system. And you can see that it says families wanted. Three or four families of large size and good characters may find employment at Blackstone Manufactory. So there you go. There's proof that they used this system. To attract families to his mill, Slater built housing for the workers. He also provided them with a company store where they could buy necessities. In addition, he started the practice of paying workers with credit at the company store. Instead of paying the full price for an item all at once, Small payments could be made over a period of time. This practice allowed Slater to reinvest his money in his business. All right, let's go back to our chart. I have some things highlighted here that we can add to it. So he built housing for the workers 
So not only do you work for Samuel Slater, but you live in his housing as well. So he's not only your boss, but now he's also your landlord. And he opened company stores that are run by him or run by the company. So basically every penny you make, which comes from Slater, goes back to Slater because you have to pay rent and you have to buy the things from the store. So the money that he's doling out to you in the form of a paycheck is coming right back to him. And people just don't do it like this anymore, right? So that's why it's different from the way things are today. In fact, um, he realizes this and he thought, well, why don't I just not even pay them in cash? I'll just pay them in store credit instead. So it's almost like a barter system. You're working for him and the payment is that you get to buy things in his store. So it's definitely very different. And in a way, he's really controlling every part of their lives. Slater's strategy of hiring families and dividing factory work into simple tasks became known as the Rhode Island system. Mill owners throughout the Northeast copied Slater's methods. Owners advertised with men with growing families wanted. They also sent recruiters to poor communities to find new workers. For many people, the chance to work in a factory was a welcome opportunity to earn money and learn a new skill. One of the earliest of the mill towns, Slatersville, was named after Samuel Slater. The town was built by Slater and his brother John. It included two houses for workers and their families, the owner's house, the company store, and the Slatersville Mill. The mill was the largest and most modern industrial building of its time. And there's a picture there on the left of one of his mills in Rhode Island. You can see it's right on the water because, of course, as we learned, you need water to power these mills at the beginning of this industrialization. The mills employed not only the textile workers who operated the machinery, but also machine part makers and dam builders. Although the company stores sold food and necessary items to workers, mill towns supported the same variety of businesses any other town needed to, to thrive. These included tailors and dressmakers, butchers, and other small workshops. So really, um, they end up becoming entire towns. It's not just housing. It's not just the mill. It's not just the company store. But really, entire towns or villages were built up around these mills. And we call them mill towns. If you look around western Pennsylvania, we have mill towns all over the place. You just may have never thought of it that way. If you find an old steel mill, for example, uh, that was built a long time ago, you'll notice that there are rows of houses within walking distance of that mill. And this is the reason why. You'll notice, like, I always think of West Mayfield as a great example. There is a mill down in West Mayfield. And within walking distance, you have stores, you have an auto garage, you have a bar and tavern, you have rows of houses. So people would have lived in those rows of houses and they would have been in walking distance to the steel mill, to the local bar, to the local store. Um, so really you see examples of this all around you. You don't have to go all the way back to the early 1800s. These these mill towns became a thing in the early 1800s, but that practice continued on for quite a while, even if the company didn't own all of the businesses in that town. All right, so that's your Rhode Island system. And basically, he's hiring entire families. Now we're going to switch over to the Lowell system. And I'm going to turn the page to get to that one. Here we go. Not all mill owners followed this system. Francis Cabot Lowell, an entrepreneur from England, New England, developed a very different approach. His ideas completely changed the textile industry in the Northeast. The Lowell system was based on water-powered textile mills that employed young, unmarried women from local farms. The system included a loom that could both spin thread and weave cloth in the same mill. Lowell constructed boarding houses for the women. Boarding house residents were given a room and meals along with their jobs. All right, so who does he hire? He only hires women and girls. He does not hire entire families. He does not hire men at all. It's just women and girls. And he does build boarding houses for them to live in, which is similar to the Rhode Island system. But again, different from the way we do things today. And the, that included a room and meals.
All right, let's see what else. With financial support from investors of the Boston Manufacturing Company, Lowell's first textile mill opened in Waltham, Massachusetts in 1814. From the first starting of the first power loom, there was not doubt about the success, wrote one investor. In 1822, the company built a larger mill in a Massachusetts town later named Lowell. Visitors to Lowell were amazed by the clean factories and neatly kept boarding houses, as well as the new machinery. The young women working in the mills soon became known as Lowell Girls. The mills paid them between two and four dollars each week. The workers were required to pay $1.25 for room and board. These wages were much better than the wages women could earn per week in other available jobs, such as domestic work. So obviously people earn more than that today, and that's why I put that in my chart. It's different from how we work today. They were earning 2 to $4 a week. Obviously 2 and $4 was worth more back then, but it's still not very much money. And um, in some cases, half your salary is going for room and board, which is a lot. That's a big percentage of your salary. All right, I'm going to keep going. You can see an image here of what it might have been like working in the textile mill. You could see this is a big water frame, and she is making sure that the bobbins and everything are kept straight. And if a bobbin is emptied, she's going to have to replace it. It would have been pretty dangerous work. Very fast paced. You have to keep up with the machines. And of course the machines are run by the moving water. So you really can't do anything to change the speed of it. It would have been pretty intense. Many young women came to Lowell from different parts of New England. They wanted the chance to earn money instead of working on the family farm. Working in the Lowell mills gave young women the opportunity to achieve economic independence. I must, of course, have something of my own before many more years have passed over my head, wrote one young woman. The typical Lowell girl worked at the mills for about four years. The Lowell system aimed to overcome the perception that factory workers had a lower social status. Unlike other factory workers, the Lowell girls were encouraged to use their free time to take classes and form women's clubs. They even wrote their own magazine, The Lowell Offering. Lucy Larkham, who started working in the Lowell Mills at age 11, later praised her fellow workers. I regard it as one of the privileges of my youth that I grew up among those active, interesting girls whose lives had principle and purpose distinctly their own. Mill life was hard, however. The workday was between 12 and 14 hours long, and daily life was carefully controlled. Ringing bells ordered workers to breakfast or lunch. Employees had to work harder and faster to keep up with new equipment. Cotton dust also began to cause health problems, such as chronic cough for workers. So let's fill in some more information on our charts. They worked 12 to 14 hours a day, six days a week. And that is different from today. Today, full-time is considered 40 hours a week, which is usually five, eight-hour days. Um, it could be different depending on your profession. Some nurses, for example, work three 12-hour shifts a week, um, but that would still be considered full-time. So it, it does depend on your profession, but today there are laws that protect us if your boss needs you to work more than the overtime hours recognized by the government, they have to compensate you for it in the form of overtime pay or extra days off. And of course, the health problems that were caused by these jobs, that is something that is strictly regulated today as well. So if you ever work in a place where you feel like you're not safe, you have ways of getting that fixed. There are laws that protect workers now. Um, there are laws that say we have to make a certain amount of money. It's called minimum wage. There are laws that say we can't work over a certain number of hours. And there are laws that require businesses and factories to have a safe working environment. And if health problems are becoming an issue, then they can be shut down. So obviously these people did not have the luxury of those laws to protect them, but it is because of their experiences that we will pass laws later to make changes. And you can see an example of their schedule here. The first bell rings at 4.30 in the morning, and then they get another bell an hour early, an hour later. And then at 6.20 a.m., the third bell rings. Um, 
this is just strictly controlling their lives. This is why we have bells that ring in school. It comes out of the Industrial Revolution. Interesting little tidbit for you there. All right, I'm going to turn the page, and we're going to move on to the bottom of our page over here in our Word document. Um, we're looking for definitions for trade unions and strikes. Uh, you can see the title of this section is Workers Organized. So because conditions were pretty tough, the workers are going to try to get that fixed. Factories continued to spread in the 1800s. Craftspeople who made goods by hand felt threatened because factories were able to produce low-priced goods more quickly. To compete with factories, shop owners had to hire more workers and pay them less. Shoemaker William Frazier complained about the situation in the mid-1840s. Quote, we have to sit on our seats from 12 to 16 hours per day to earn one dollar. The wages of factory workers also went down as people competed for jobs. A wave of immigration in the 1840s brought people from other poorer countries. They were willing to work for low pay. More immigrants came to the Northeast where the mills were located than to the South. Competition for jobs also came from people unemployed during the financial panic of 1837. For example, about 50,000 workers in New York City alone lost their jobs. The beginning of trade unions. Facing low wages and the fear of losing their jobs, skilled workers formed trade unions, groups that tried to improve pay and working conditions. Eventually, unskilled factory workers also formed trade unions, seeking economic equity. Most employers did not want to hire union workers. Employers believed that the higher cost of union employees prevented competition with other manufacturers. Sometimes, labor unions staged protests called strikes. Workers on strike refused to work until employers meet their demands. Most early strikes were not successful, however. Courts and police usually supported companies, not the striking union members. And this goes on to give details about specific unions and specific people. We're not going to get into all of that. You obviously can read through that if that's a topic that interests you. But I really just want to paint the big picture for you. And that is that this is the era when unions are going to form. Um, so let's define what that means. It's a workers' organization that tries to improve pay and working conditions. The idea is if you have an, a group of workers demanding more money, shorter work days, safer working conditions, that odds are they're going to get it rather than if one person just goes to their boss and says, I want you to pay me more money. He's going to say, yeah, right, you're fired, just leave, I'll hire someone else in your place. But if the entire workforce comes to him and says, we're not going to work until you pay us more money, then he might be more likely to respond. Their goal at this point in time was a 10-hour workday. Today, our workday is measured as an eight-hour day, so we're kind of inching our way in that direction. But prior to the trade unions fighting for a 10-hour workday, the workdays could range anywhere from 12 to 16 hours a day. And the strike is really their power. Um, if they refuse to perform their jobs, then the mill can't run. And if the mill doesn't run, the boss doesn't make money. So that is their most powerful tool, is basically a threat to go on strike if their demands are not met. So this is where we're starting to see unions formed. They're not very successful in the early days, but their success will grow over time. All right, that was section two. If you need anything clarified, just send me a message. Uh, the next section will be about the transportation revolution.